may your schools that your kingdom may expand through us as we gather through Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Once again, welcome. This is the continuation of the first Bible study on Jonah. Last week was just introduction. Today, <clears throat> we are using Jonah as a springboard to discuss prophetic hazards. And that component, we just have a look at the expensive crews. And I will read to you the first three verses of Jonah chapter one. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah, rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. This is the word of the Spirit to God. We're going to have a analysis like a sausage of handling prophetic issues in terms of prophetic hazards and zero on the expensive cruise that Jonah made. But we will start from Genesis. And, but before then, let me get going with definition. And I will spend some time on explaining the words involved in this statement. A prophet is a person of three dimensions, either one on or all three. Is a person who speaks for God that you dream or see vision does not make you a prophet. You have spiritual gifts. A prophet is somebody, is a person who speaks for God, or is a divinely inspired teacher or interpreter of the will of God. I know in the Orthodox Church, in the Anglican Church, when a priest is being ordained, they will tell you, do your priestly and prophetic assignments in the power of the Lord. May the Lord be with you. If your sermons and teachings are not inspired and relevant, sometimes when an inspired preacher is preaching, that's what he's talking about. So a prophet may not necessarily just see visions or may not even see visions, but he's so divinely inspired and he will talk into your circumstance when he sees you. And you wonder, are you a prophet? Or, and this is the one that's most commonly thought of as who a prophet is, or is a person who predicts the future or foretells the future events. But we're talking about the hazards of this office. We're talking about the danger, the peril, the risk, the jeopardy, the threat, the menace of the prophetic office. And sometimes it can be very expensive, very dear, very costly, not just in terms of money. It can be life-threatening, very expensive, high prices, exorbitant. And this, Talk is all about the expensive crews of a prophetic hazard. You see, normally it cruises the voyage which a ship sails to and fro over a particular region that's their trading stock, especially for the protection of shipping or for pleasure. So let's now talk about the prophetic crews. <clears throat> By way of introduction, what the prophets speak on God's behalf, or where they deliver the message, is not particularly or necessarily what they decide or enjoy doing, is an assignment. And how they do it can become either their assets or liability with God or man on the day of judgment. 
God's name is peculiar. I am that I am. That means you cannot predict him. He's just unique. And that was what he told Moses, who is our case today before I come to Jonah. He told Moses, I am who I am. Tell the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So let's take Moses as case study. If you excuse me. Moses as case study. <clears throat> you could see him 40 years at the age of 80. He had been with his father in law, going the harsh man and see this burning bush where the tree remains green. That was, that was his official calling at the age of 80. You could see the drama of this artist, artist depiction of what Moses saw. It was blinding. It's blinding. That's what sometimes, if I Paul saw that one, I couldn't see very well again. The other of the prophets, they, they have a profile that is unique and different. Blinding light. That the artist has depicted him very well, he had to cover his face, talking to God. It's difficult to look at the blinding light of light. And he said to him, I'm the God of your father, <clears throat> the God of Abraham, <clears throat> the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look at God. He tried to persuade God to send somebody, but God would not oblige. He was talking of his, imagine his current low societal position, a fugitive for 40 years, now going to Egyptian palace. Moses said to the Lord, behold, I am of a circumcised lips. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? See my profile. I used to be in the palace. But then the conversation will not go to the blend of Moses' plea or expectation. You see, there have been a previous situation that Moses will, by all means, want to avoid. It was life-threatening. And he could still be executed. 40 years ago, you will remember, when he killed an Egyptian and Pharaoh had, the Bible says, and he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by the well. Remember memory lanes, how he got his wife. That, well, that was a particular well, running for dear life from Pharaoh, meeting, getting to Midian, he had to wrestle and fight out those who were harassing. The man, the man must be a physical wrestler. He could remember memory lane, running from one place to another. He tried to persuade God to send somebody else because of his stammering, which could hinder communication. If you look too much intently on his stammerer, you compound his problem. He said to the Lord, oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, either here to fall. In other words, if I came to you, I've been a stammerer. Since you have been speaking to me, the miracle of my, of, of my speech has not become a testimony. <clears throat> and God answered him, who made, man, who, who made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf? Or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? God will not be persuaded. Then he brought God back to memory lane. If you can see that sea of heads, remembering 40 year old profile of the, of, 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 of the Israelites, he tried to persuade God to send somebody else because of the unlikelihood of the children of Israel to believe him. He answered God, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. They will say the Lord did not appear to you. Lona with God on his knees. Pardon your servant Lord, please send somebody else. Sometimes you have this problem, this tell me <clears throat> with God. And the hazard had already begun. The body language of reluctance had already started. This map 
is a very good pro you know, profile of the 10,750 kilometers journey was to make. On the right side is Arabia and the land of Median. On the left side is Egyptian, is, is it Egypt as a country. That peninsula, that, that's, that, that's, that lower tongue of the land, Sinai, you know, all these as men, they go, they go kilometers. It's around Sinai, he encountered God. And God was saying, you have to leave this right side as your base. I'm sending you 10,000, 700 kilometers away. And the hard hand price on the, in the land of media for 40 years, that is Zephora. You can imagine their journey back to Egypt, either on a donkey or on a camel, everything going fine. And by the time Moses was going, it was 500 years since Abraham has had, had, had the, com, the circumcision covenant with God. That you work for God does not exempt you from what God has spoken about problems of generational disobedience. So more, they were coming and the Bible says, at the lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. Because if you, if you, if you remember Psalm 103, bless the Lord, you angels of God, who do the, you host, heavenly host, who do the work? Angels are like the heavenly policemen who carry out and do the right thing against those who are defaulters. We are told, you see, when you are in a, when you are in a live program of meeting with God, you just know. Zebra took a flint and cut off her son's first king, circumcised her children, and taught Moses feet with it, and said, surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So the angel left him alone. That was one of the Azaks. He had been on his, he had been, he had been quiet for 80 years. He had been away from Egypt. He is a descendant of Abraham, and the calling did not come until the age of 80, and he still has a deficit of non-compliance of Abrahamic covenants of circumcision. Fine, arrival at Egypt, we're still talking about Moses, as case study, let my people go. You can see they are back facing the throne, majestic Pharaoh, to, you can even imagine how wretched they will do, they will come from nowhere to the palace of Egypt, you need courage. But the life-threatening Pharaoh to steal it to Moses was another kettle of fish. Because all those factors notwithstanding, difficulties of the prophetic ministry that did arise involve a few processes we'll talk about. Pharaoh's low esteem of Moses, much prized God. You ran away 40 years ago. You are not saying you have seen the vision. Who is the Lord, Pharaoh said, that I should heed him? Who is the Lord that you heed his voice and let him go? And, and Pharaoh said, I do not know the Lord. And moreover, I will not let Israel go. You can imagine two octogenarians. Moses was younger, he was already 80, Aaron will be older. I could see the palatial, majestic, confident Pharaoh who is saying, Who is that Lord that I do heed his voice? Prophetic hazards. Moses has case study. I could see one of his sitting rooms where he was having a nap. That's his queen. So Lying down there will be with the cotton room, and Moses was, I mean, Pharaoh was in a frenzy. I do not know the Lord. And moreover, I will not let Israel go. Those are details of video clips that remind you of how much problems prophets go through when they are sent. And it escalated to a negative reaction of Pharaoh. He now commanded that they should have it harder and told them in the underlined passage of Exodus 5, verse 7, you shall no longer give these people straw to make bricks. As before, let them go and gather straw. He compounded and doubled their work. And if you have ever seen slaves, you could see the large marks. If they did not comply, they could be beaten to death. So greater hostilities. Well, not you, Moses was between God and the stubborn Pharaoh, as well as the hostile 
Israelites who are now saying who are, who are just quietly waiting. Why did you? So you could see the way they were raising their hands against him. The Lord look upon you, the people say, to Moses and Aaron. The Lord look upon you and judge because you have made us offensive in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Sometimes you are the only one who can vow that what you're saying is true until God exonerates you, there are hazards in prophetic offices. Life-threatening Pharaoh's hostility continued to Moses, very reactive hostility of the Israelites to Moses. And we're told in chapter six of Exodus, Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and their cruel bondage, prophetic hazards. So Pharaoh said at one point, get away from me. Take heed to yourself. Never see my face again. For on the day you see my face, you shall surely die. You can see these three faces. The fresh one of Pharaoh, the two Moses was looking, was looking old and beaten and Aaron. This is the way he could go behind the curtain. You go to Aso Villa, you go to White House, you go behind the screen and they warn you that you are, you are, you are handling grease. In the lead, you see my face, you just surely die. And Moses replied him, as you say, I will not see your face again. So when we're talking about hazards of prophetic office, they are not small. Let's now come to Jonah. Moses lived around 1044 BC, 700 years. Around 750 BC was, you know, from 780 to 750 BC was when Jonah came on board. And now Jonah had this assignment. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai saying, go, cry against that city. This is your assignment. And you could see the way this artist has given the dramatic. Sometimes this has happened to me before. You feel like running away from God. We too were told, but Jonah rose up to flee to touch from the presence of the Lord. No shoe on that, that God has started again. I won't forgotten Psalm 139. Where shall I go? Verse 7 son? Where shall I go from your spirits? Or without your life, flee from your presence. For God said, arise, go. Let's us see Jonah's geography. You can see this center, this, this, this circle in the center. That's his commission. He was living in Gath Epa, about 60 miles from Joba. He was living in the north of Israel. He would come down like to like from north to like, like from the north to where the seaport is to Joba. He was supposed to go to rice. Rice is his fulfillment direction in, in Nineveh, but the man went left. He paid his fear to go to a place five times longer. He was to have gone to a city like this, depicted the most modern of his time. Expected destination was the biggest city of the, you just like say you are coming to Las Vegas, very expensive very, very posh, go there. And you probably will be realizing behind stage, what am I going to do in this type of city? Am I going to put my hand near my mouth and say, he said, go and cry against it. Sometimes when you see the assignment God has given you and you realize behind closed doors, you find it ridiculous. This is what you will come to do in that great city, over 5,000 miles away from where he was living, and you have to get to the center and tell them all of you are wicked. That's the pottery with their pots for water. Some are going to draw water. Some are in the city and this, some are on camel. And this straight man from nowhere, all these slaves is coming to tell us you are wicked. You see, those, are, those are the issues. And now see the depiction of Nineveh. On stage, I just sketched queens of the shrine, 
idolatry. On the left, idolatry. In the center, idolatry. On the right, idolatry. On the floor of the stage, a lot of frenzies, immorality. There are there are cult prostitutes. In the where you are in the where you are in the shrine, you can do anything. On the left, some of people, some people are beating each other. That's the stuff of wickedness, immorality, wickedness, idolatry. It is a freedom to do what you like. So when you are talking, when you are reading in between the lines of human possibilities, Jonah was 60 miles from his hometown, Gazepa. He was to go to Joppa down. He was tra his traveling risk was to be considered to world power territory. How about the hammer of racial hostilities in Assyrian territories? How about his even put personal dislikes for Nineveh? How about he expected wide reactions to open up position of the government? Will he come back alive? Those are issues of in between the lines when we're talking about you know, the hazards of a prophet. And in the words of Jeremiah, who lived about 100 to 150 years after him, Jeremiah said, his word was in my heart as a burning fire, chopped up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not hold it back. If God has ever sent you on a mission, or you deliver it, you are not at peace. So for Jonah, he was an Israelite, and God was planning for the unfriendly navy for their personal salvation. But Jonah was not personally profiled to talk to them. So on the line, instead of going right, he went down to Joppa. He went to the seaport. He found a ship going to Tarshish. That's about 8,000 miles away. He paid the fare. He went on board to go to that Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. That's the foolishness of the ridicule. This was an expensive cruise. The human reaction to God was a change, was to change physical environment. We were talking about Tabora last, you know, last week. It's common even in the old times. People go to sleep on mountains of religious area to see revelation where they think God, God is. And that is the impulse of the anointed environment is part of what the prophetic has coined as the presence of God. The Mediterranean Sea was a, was, a, was, a, was a water way to Tarshish, to a less spiritual habitat you would imagine. He rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And what next? The old and new cities. Nineveh, the oldest and most populous city in the Assyrian Empire, situated on the east bank of the Tigris River, enriched by is the modern city of Mosul in Iraq. Tashish was an ancient city located in modern day southern Spain, north of Gibraltar. So throughout the Bible, Tashish, the word itself was used in different contexts. But for now, see that map is like the handle of a fan from Jerusalem is to go towards right, but you would rather go towards left. So you can see from Joppa down, he was supposed to go to right, but he was making his way to left. And in a very graphic way, he was to go and travel 500 miles by water. He decided to go five times to 2,500 miles away towards Spain. So these are issues. He paid for the expensive coups of his life. And he paid. Joppa means beautiful. He went to the beautiful port. He paid money to go to Tarshish, which means melting plant. Sometimes we pray. Sometimes we pay for our troubles. So you see, Pilgrims, sometimes we do what we call penance. In the Old Testament during the pilgrimage, when they thought they did not do God right, the Israelites presumed to go to the heights of the hill country. 
Although neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp, when you go to where God has not sent you, of course, some of them were killed. So away from the presence of the Lord is where you meet risks that many times are man. Let us talk about expensive cruise of Pharaoh. Pharaoh, that Pharaoh went through 10 plagues. Daring God was an expensive cruise for him because he took Egypt with him and God would spear Goshen where he was and give them headache. You could see the flies. The eighth plague was the locusts. They were going into farming, all the farmlands. And when we're talking about the presence of God and distinctions, the difference is clear. And God told Pharaoh on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell. That's Exodus 8.22. I will set apart. There will be distinction. And the Lord did, say, did so, the Bible says in verse 24, there came great swarms of flies in the house of Pharaoh and all his servants and in all the land of Egypt and the land was ruined by reason of the flies. The other calamities, they were warned in Exodus 11, 7. It said, but against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, not a dog shall grow that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egyptians and the Israelites. Hail destroyed them, but we're told in Exodus 9, 26, only in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel, there was no hail. So the presence of the Lord, where God is, there is always the difference is clear. Let's go and see the plague of darkness. Three days, no moon, no sunlight, and the Bible says they could not even see each other. There will be light in Goshen. And the last plague of this expensive cruise of Pharaoh. Pharaoh used to be called a god who will make the sun rise. He too was the first to lose his firstborn. So talking about the hazards that the priests and the evangelists or the Christian of God will face when we do our prophetic, our prophetic assignments. In ministry, it has always been spelled out by God. In Moses' time, God told Moses, I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compiled by my mighty hand. So God is not, un he's not unaware of the problems we meet. Just talk a little bit. I like this pastor's analysis of what the prayers of God amounts to in the Bible. The Lord is immanent and he's also transcendent. What does he mean? He's in the heaven above, that is, he's in transcendent. He's on earth beneath, that is immanent. He's in heaven and on earth, Joshua 2, 11. But to understand God in full, we must recognize that he's drawing near to creation, you know, has many factors. The Bible emphasizes that God, God's manifest presence, not only his omnipotence, He's everywhere, but when he's with you, you know he's around. He can make you feel his presence. So I wonder that nine verse five, first Kings eight twenty seven. So the glory, the story of the scripture begins and ends with the presence of God. Humanity's mission and the presence of God, they are inseparable. Sin will make the presence of God away from you. You know, in the David was they don't take away all his spirit from you. So God, God's covenant brings his presence back to his people. The presence of God is a means and end of redemption. It is the greatest expression of this God Emmanuel with us. When God is with you, 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 you will know and your, your nerves will relax. Let's go. In Jeremiah's time, he was telling them, I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave you. When God is with you, nobody needs to, even outsiders will know that God must be with you. That's Jeremiah preaching to people. In the time of Ezekiel, although he was in Babylon in captivity, he warned him, they will not believe you, but you must still tell them. At least they will know a priest 
a, a, a prophet has existed in that miss. Jews has always shown their captivity. See that man carrying a block and carrying, you know, calling out a bluff. So those are the things that they went through. But then Jesus Christ, he will now come to New Testament. John chapter 16, verse 1, he said, Jesus Christ said, I have said all this to you to keep you from falling away. The first verse of chapter 16, he said this. In the last verse, John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I will overcome the world. So he has warned his people. That's Paul being prayed for by Ananias. And God told that prophetic message, I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Prophetic assets. Timothy was charged. He, you know, and First Timothy 1.19, we are warned against holding the faith and getting it coinciding with a good conscience. Because having thrust away the good conscience, many people will make a shipwreck. People are making money by all this without, without a good conscience of how God has told them to do it. So the expensive crews, Paul talked about the smith, silver smith and how they did him harm. And now, before I stop talking, what is your reaction to difficulties in the faith? Is it combining of faith that they call syncretism? Or is it a absolute, you know, absolute rebellion or getting shortcuts? That's Saul going to the medium because God will not answer him by dreams or urim or by prophets. Sometimes we cut bends when we think God is too, too late. And this is the end time depicted. Jesus said it about the wedding garments. We may join ourselves to the number of, you see, there are many people trooping in the church today, but on the judgment day, Jesus Christ said he would tell them to whisk out people who are not with wedding garments. That's Giazi. Some people say anointing without wealth is annoyance. And I know Gazi vowed that he would get money from that Naman. So, and he did that one and ended up with leprosy. The challenge of Micaiah, one man who, who they told, who they said, look good, go and prophesy well in the White House, go and give good prophecy and let them make your money. And the man said, as the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me that I will speak. So, we will talk more about Jonah in the next telecast, but at what cost, I want to ask, did all the role, all the incidents happen? At what cost do you do your assignments? Naman was leprous. Kiazi got his finger burnt. Our memory verse, Jonah rose to flee to